Uh, so today's lecture is about Kepler's laws. And so this lecture is going to be the probably the most math oriented type lecture that I'm going to give. I'm going to sort of step through doing some problems of the kind that you'll be doing on your homework and then also on the exams. So I'm going to try to liven it up a little bit, uh, but this will probably be sort of on the dry side um, in terms of the lectures in this course. But so I'm trying to pack a lot of it into one and then I'll, I'll move on and do more sort of fun contextual stuff later. But please do stop me if you have any questions about anything. So uh, if you recall, uh, there was this guy, Tycho Brahe. He, this, is, this is a painting of him that probably he commissioned because his nose isn't metal. But he had a metal nose, if you remember. He was the guy who lost a, a nose in a sword fight about who the best mathematician was. He was sort of this larger than life guy who ended up um, because basically by the luck of the draw discovered a new star. So he discovered the supernova in the sky and this made him world famous. And eventually he leveraged this into sort of getting uh, bankrolled by the king. He was set up with his own private observatory on an island that he used to then gather all kinds of um, astronomical data that eventually would lead to a revolution or understanding of what was going on uh, up there in the heavens. Um, what eventually happened is the data that he had collected got transferred to Kepler. And the story goes something like this. Um, around 1597, Tycho actually had a fight with the new king. So this wasn't the king who originally liked him. It was the new king. They had a fight. And for one, re one reason or another, he had to leave this sort of fancy island that he had. Um, but uh, he was invited by the Czech king. and. The, uh, Rudolf II, who happened to be the Holy Roman Emperor at the time, who had a lot of power, he was invited to Prague to be with him to effectively be uh, the royal astronomer, or the, sorry, the imperial astronomer at the time. Um, so between the period of 1600 and 601, while he was at this new place outside of Prague, he was uh, assisted by Kepler. So Kepler had contacted him and really wanted to work with him. Kepler was obsessed with building a model to explain the orbits of the planets. Recall that at this time, Kepler, or sorry, Copernicus had already put forth his idea that the sun sat at the center of all the planets in the solar system and they went around us in a circle, and they went around the sun in a circle. But that model actually did no better than Ptolemy's model. And so what Kepler was obsessed with was figuring out a way to make this basic idea of a heliocentric solar system work. Uh, but actually match what you see up in the sky. And this turned out to be a kind of a hard problem. And it was something that uh, Tycho worked on in different ways. And it was a really, a really challenging issue at the time. So Kepler wanted to work on that. And that's why he went to go talk to, to Tycho, because Tycho had all this great data. All right. So uh, if you recall, Tycho died unexpectedly in the year 1601. Um, people. There's discussion about exactly what killed him. Some people think he was poisoned. Some people think he died of a burst bladder. Uh, but he died unexpectedly in 1601. And Kepler was appointed his successor. So he became the, royal, the imperial astronomer, imperial mathematician. And he took over all of Kepler's data. And it was his job now to sort of make sense of all these data. And he sort of went with it. He was also effectively bankrolled by their emperor, and he was supported. What his main job was actually was to be an astrologer, right? So this was still in the time period where a lot of people believed astrology, and he was supposed to do astrological readings, OK? So uh, he, he did that. He didn't really, it's hard to tell whether or not he took them seriously or not. As I'll talk about next time, this is a really interesting transition period where you have people doing fundamental scientific work that has lasting legacy in the modern era. And those same people were sort of believing in all kinds of stuff that now that we think of as sort of crackpotty like alchemy and astrology. Um, but anyway, Kepler was basically employed to be an astrologer. However, the king was also interested in science and supported him to do this science on the side. So basically now he was in a position where he was supported. He didn't have to worry about paying the bills or, or whatever. And he could focus his time and energy on trying to unlock this mystery of what was going on with the planets in their orbits in the sky. 
So after about 10 years of work or nine years of hard work, Kepler effectively cracked the code. And the big trick here was that he figured out that if he allowed the planets to orbit not on circles, which is what Copernicus had proposed they were doing, but instead allowed them to orbit on ellipses, then suddenly he could make everything work. So uh, the way he did this is he always put the sun at one of the foci of the ellipse. Of the, so the way you define an ellipse mathematically or algebraically is if you have two foci, two points, and you, the ellipse is the shape drawn on the outside of those two foci where the distance a plus b is always constant. So you could change the length of a plus b, but, but if you add these two together, that length is always constant. And the sun sits at one of those specific points. The other point is effectively just an artificial point. So if you look in our solar system, the other focus doesn't really have that much of a meaning, a physical meaning. It's more of a mathematical construct. Um, so in the context of putting planets on ellipses, he also derived three laws of planetary motion. So these were empirical laws. What that means is they were derived by looking at the universe and figuring out laws that seem to, uh, f figuring out sort of um, regularities that these observations seem to obey. Now eventually Isaac Newton would show that all three of Kepler's laws could be deduced from his theory of gravitation. But at this time when Kepler was working, there was no theory of gravitation. People didn't know really what gravity was. So this was just entirely laws that he came up with by just comparing the data. Okay, are there any questions about that? So here, here are Kepler's laws. So the first one um, I'm gonna call the law of orbits, okay? So the law of orbits basically has to do with asking this question. On what paths do the planets orbit? And this is one we've already talked about the planets all move in elliptical orbits with the sun sitting at one focus. So we've talked about that already. The second one is called the law of areas, but this has to do with how fast planets are moving. So if you ask how, first, the first question he asks is how do they move around? The answer is on ellipses. The second question is how fast do they move? So this is a little complicated and I'm gonna walk you through this, but this is the way to state the answer. If you take a line that connects a planet to the sun, that line sweeps out an equal area in equal times. Okay, so if you take a line and connect the planet to the sun, and you look at the area that that thing sweeps out over time, over each second in time, it sweeps out the same area. Now if you don't, understand what that means, that's okay. We're gonna talk about it in a second. The third one is called the law of periods. And that's basically, the period is how long it takes to go around. So the question is, how long does it take a planet to go all the way around in its ellipse? This one is the most mathematically complicated. I'm gonna spend more time on it. But it's something that you can definitely grasp. And the way to state this one is this way. The square of the period of any planet, so the period is how long it takes to go around, you take that period and you square it, that's proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. Now I'm gonna break this down into, into words that might make more sense, but I just wanted to write them all out for you here so you see them once, and now we're gonna walk through them all. Before I do that, does anyone have any questions? Okay. So here's Kepler's fir first law. We've done this many times, but let's just make sure we've got it. Um, on what paths do the planets orbit? They orbit on ellipses. You put the sun at one of the foci. Here's another focus that's just kind of there for bookkeeping purposes. And then the planets go around like this on this ellipse. Now the ellipses aren't all the same shapes, they're just ellipses. So some can be almost circles, some can be really uh, flattened, but in general this describes orbits. 
Kepler's second law. How fast do the planets go around? Well, they go around such that they sweep out equal orbits in equal times. So look at this movie here uh, to your left. What's this show what this is showing is you have a planet that's ticking along around a pretty elliptical orbit around the sun. It turns out most planets are not orbiting in ellipses that are this flattened. But this is just for illustrative purposes. So notice, first of all, don't worry about the areas or anything first. Just, just watch it go around. One thing you'll notice is that when it's far away from the sun, it slows way down. And when it gets close to the sun, it's moving really fast. You see that? So now it's going slow because it's far away from the sun. But as it gets closer to the sun, it's going to speed up and up and up. Now, the other thing I want you to look at now is this little triangle right here and this triangle here. It's kind of a big sort of triangle thing. This one, because it's a very long triangle and this one's a very short triangle, they actually both have the same area. So if you calculate how much sort of carpet it would take to lay across that triangle and this triangle, it would be the same. It would cost you the same. Does that make sense? Now, between each dot is the same amount of time. So you can think of this as sort of a week or a month or something. In this month, it moves this far. And in this month, it moved that far. OK, so in order to sweep out the same area in the same amount of time, when you're far away from the sun, you have to go slow because your triangles are very long. So this end of the triangle can't be very big. But if you're close to the sun, this part of the triangle is short, so this, this edge of the triangle has to be very long. See what I mean? So in this picture to your right, it's sort of the same thing. Imagine it's the same amount of time between here and here. Well, this area is going to be the same as, say, this area. But since this is the same amount of time here and you traveled farther, you must be going faster when you're closer to the sun and slower when you're farther away from the sun. Does that make sense? Are there any questions about this? So what you imagine is stuff gets close to the sun, it's like and then slows up. And then sort of like that. Yeah? So would the T be different in each point? The T, OK, so the time between each point is always the same. Think of it as a week or something. But the time would progress. So this would be like start of the year, and then one week later, one week later, one week later. But it's always one week in between the points in this movie. And the area would always be the same? The area is always the same. Okay. That's the essence of, Kep of Kepler's second law. So in the same amount of time, you always sweep out the same area. And you could change that time up. You could do it for one day. You could do it for one week. You could do it for one month. But the answer is you always get the same answer for the area over that same time period. OK, so like the T could be like a week, and then the other T could be like a day, and it'll still be. No, 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 no. The T, sorry. So in this movie, for example, the T is always a week. Oh. The tick, imagine it's just a clock ticking, and every tick is a week. Tick, tick, tick. So every one of those is one week. And so sometimes it moves really far in a week. And sometimes it moves really uh, short in a week. So if you move really far in a week, you're going fast. If it takes you a long time to go some distance in it. If you go a very small distance in a week, you're going slow. Thanks for the question. Other, other questions? Now, this effect becomes more important the more elliptical your orbit is, right? If you're in a circle, all this is saying is you're moving the same speed all the time because you're always the same distance from the sun. You just go the same speed all the way around. So here's another movie that kind of illustrates this too. Here's two different example orbits orbiting a sun. Whereas now, you've got this guy, which is in a circle. So every tick, again, imagine it's a week or a few days, uh, had the, the triangle stays the same length and the same width. So it's just the same triangle going around. But here, it's a skinny triangle, and then it becomes a fatter triangle. So you're really seeing the thing in the elongated orbit whip around fast when it's close to the sun and go slow when it's far away from the sun. Does that make sense?
So in really extreme orbits, and you see this kind of thing with comets actually in the solar system, when they come plunging near the Earth they're going, or near the Sun, they're going really fast. But then when they come way out in the back of the, so, out of the outer part of the solar system, they just hang out there before they fall back in again. So you know, you can imagine like yourself jumping on a trampoline. You're jumping up high, you're going slow, and then when you go fast, right? It's sort of like that. You just have a little bit of an orbit, a little bit of a sideways motion too. Okay, questions about that? Yeah? So is it like the time's always the same and the area's always the same, but the distance can differ? So the area is always the same. The time is you have to pick a time. So what Kepler said is, you give me a time. Tell me your favorite time, a day. You give me a day, every single planet will sweep out the same distance, the same area in that day, no matter how far away it is from the sun. Does that make sense? So the farther away it is, the longer this edge of the triangle is. And so therefore, it's going to be going slower. Because if it just moves even a little bit, it's still got a lot of area. But in that day, if you're close to the sun, it's moving so fast. Sorry, if you're close to the sun, it has to move fast to create a triangle that has enough area as the other case. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, good question. So the question is, so on, on the Earth, because we're in elliptical orbit, do we notice a big temperature difference? Because we are closer to the sun sometimes than others. Um, it's a very, very small effect on the Earth because it turns out our ellipticity is very small. I'll show you a picture of this in a second, but even though we're on an ellipse, it's, if you just saw it, you would just approximate it as in a circle, as a circle. It's nothing like this. So over the course of the year, we do get a little bit closer to the sun. Uh, and it turns out it's during our winter time. So in the winter time in the northern hemisphere, we're a little bit closer to the sun. That actually just happened like last week, I think. We were as close as we ever get to the sun. But it's not that much closer that it matters. So the sun is a couple percent bigger in the sky. But given all the other things to determine weather and temperature, it, it doesn't affect things that much. Now, there are other planets that we know about that orbit other stars um, that are on much more plunging orbits than the Earth. And we think that that matters. And it's the kind of thing we think about when we might imagine whether or not there could be life on those planets. Because they might have really wide, wild temperature swings because of this kind of plunging thing. It's a good question. Yeah? Yes. Right, right. It's every single planet. That's right, right. So, right. Planets that are farther, th that's right. So, it's in any individual planet sweeps out the same area in the same amount of time. That's right. Okay. All right. Great. Great. Okay. So, um, the third law is this one. How long does it take to go around? Now, this one is the most, most sort of mathematically, you have to state it using the most mathematical jargon. Um, but a short way to say it that's not very precise but qualitatively gives the feel is that more distant planets take longer to go around. So planets that are far away from the sun take longer to go all the way around the sun than planets that are close in. Okay? So for example, Mercury is closer to the sun. So it takes a shorter amount of time to go around than the sun. Now, let me ask you this. What's the period of the sun around the, of the Earth around the sun? That was great, but I didn't hear anything. 365 days. Great. A year. Okay? So our period around the sun is a year. Mercury is closer to the sun than the Earth, so its period is shorter than a year or longer than a year? Shorter. Jupiter, it's way out there. Does it take it longer than a year or shorter than a year to go around the sun? Longer. Okay? So that's qualitatively what's going on. Now note it doesn't have to be that way, right? In principle, you could make, you could put a rocket pack on the back of Jupiter and make it go around faster than, you know, make it go all the way around faster than a year. It would just have to be moving really fast. But in practice, empirically, Kepler discovered that's not what goes on. 
The thing about it is he found an even more precise statement of the problem. Not only was it true that planets that are farther away take longer to go around the sun, but there is a precise mathematical relationship between their distance from the sun and how long it took them to go around. All right? So, and specifically, it's the square of the planet's period, that's how long it takes to go around, is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. So let's break this down. First of all, what's the semi-major axis? So the first thing to think about is, um, let, me, let me walk through this for a second. Um, so what are these words? Okay, period, we already talked about that. Okay, it's how long it takes to go around. What's the semi-major axis? The semi-major axis is you could just sort of think of it as a radius, okay? If everything was going around in a circle, it would just be the radius of that circle. And when you think about it in your head, just think of it that way, okay? But more precisely what it is, is if you define an ellipse that way, there's a long uh, axis, which is called the major axis, and there's a short axis, which is called the minor axis, and the semi-major axis is just half of that. So it's sort of like the radius, it's sort of like the long radius. If you think of this as the long radius and the short radius, it's sort of like the long radius, okay? It's just you have, to you have to define it precisely, but that's what it means. Okay. Now, what about this other word, uh, proportional to? Who's heard the word proportional to? Who has not really heard the word proportional to and is a little confused by that word? Really? Everyone's cool with proportional to? All right, good. Um, so one way to state this is this way. So rather than having to write it out in words, this is a little hard to sort of get your brain around. Another way to write this equation, another way to write this is this way. Um, this thing proportional to means that you can compare it to other planets. So specifically, one thing you could do is you could say, well, if I have some planet, and I take its period and I square it. And then I take the period of the Earth around the sun, which is a year, and I square that. And then I put these two things in ratio. That is always equal to the semi-major axis of that planet cubed divided by the semi-major axis of the Earth cubed. So that's this. These words here are rewritten this way in reference to the Earth because we th we're used to thinking about the Earth. So let's walk through this. Here's our ellipse. Here's our planet, the semi-major axis of the planet we're concerned with. Okay, period of the Earth. What's the period of the Earth? Yeah, let's go with the shorter one, the year. Let's go with the year, okay? What's the distance between the Earth and the Sun? Good, so the people who've taken astronomy before who are super geeks, they know that we call it an astronomical unit. But if you wanted it in meters, it turns out the distance between the Earth and the Sun is 1.5 to 10 to the 11 meters or as astronomers like to call it, one astronomical unit, okay? We call it an astronomical unit. It's easy. A lot of things are referenced with respect to how far the Earth is from the sun. This number here is kind of big and hard to remember. So we just say the distance between the Earth and the sun is called one astronomical unit, and all other distances in the solar system we will just give in astronomical units. So if something's a half an astronomical unit, you know it's just half as far from the sun as the Earth is, et cetera. Okay? It's just a useful unit of measure. All right? So the point is we know our Earth and we know P Earth. So we know these two things right here. So what that means is if you give me any, either the period of the planet around the sun, then I can tell you its distance from the sun precisely. Or if you tell me the planet's distance from the sun, I can tell you its period around the sun precisely. Does that make sense? So let me just give you an example. Let's suppose you're given a problem 
Okay? And the problem basically goes like this. How far away is Jupiter from the sun? Given the period of Jupiter, it turns out that Jupiter orbits the sun once every 11.85 years. So Jupiter goes all the way around the sun once in the, in the amount of time we can go around the sun almost 12 times. But given this information, how far away is Jupiter from the sun? We know the period of the Earth, we know the distance from the Earth to the sun, and we know we're given the period of Jupiter, so we have three of these numbers and we just need to solve for one. So let's set this problem up. So I want to rewrite this equation this way. The period of Jupiter divided by a year squared is equal to the distance between the Jupiter and the sun divided by 1 AU cubed. That's just rewriting this equation using a year and an AU. Is that, is that okay? Yes? Is that the average distance from the sun? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're in, I'm being a little bit sloppy. So it, we're in almost a circular orbit. So the average distance from the sun is defined to be an astronomical unit. And it turns out that's also close to its semi-major axis, too. Because the Earth's orbit is actually pretty close to circular. So I'm being a little sloppy, but yeah, in detail, it's not quite that. Other questions? OK. So then we just plug in the period of Jupiter. That's 11.85 years. I cancel out the years, and then I square it, and I keep the right-hand side the same. You could, do, you could solve this problem a few different ways. Uh, if you square 11.85, it turns into 140.4, and then I take the cube root of both sides. And then I solve for r Jupiter, and it's 5.2 AU. So some of you are in this class are like physics majors and engineers and stuff like that. You will have no trouble solving these equations. If you do have trouble solving those equations, you should consider a different major. <laughs> but some of you have not done math in years, OK? And that's because you've been spending your time doing hard stuff, like reading hard works of uh, literature and critiquing them and thinking about other things, right? And so you might be a little rusty on this kind of stuff. Now, I know for a fact that at some point in your life, you could do this because you're at this school, right? So I know you can do it. But if you're a little, if this kind of stuff makes you nervous, that's OK. Just spend some time working this stuff out when I assign the homework. Okay? If you have questions, you can always come talk to me or Sean, the TA, and we're going to have extra office hours for this kind of stuff too. All right? But before I go on from this, are we good with this, with this solution? Yeah? You OK? OK. So you could say, you know, how far away is Jupiter from the sun? It's 5.2 times farther away than the Earth. But the point here is, is there a very precise relationship between the period and the distance? And as I'll mention later, this applies to all things that orbit the sun. And in fact, it applies to all things that orbit the Earth. So if you have something orbiting around the Earth, it obeys these kind of relations as well. Uh, here's just another example. Mars has a period of 1.6 years. How far away is Mars from the sun? Oh, sorry, that was a typo. Mars has a period of 1.9 years. I typed it in wrong the first time I did it. I forgot to fix it. Mars has a period of 1.9 years. How far away is Mars from the sun? In the next slide, I fixed it. I forgot to fix it on the first slide. OK. So how do we do this? It's sort of the same thing, but I'll just sort of walk you through it. You rewrite this equation, P Mars over a year squared equals R Mars over an AU cubed. The period of Mars is 1.9 years. You plug it in. So this time I decided to take the cube root of both sides first. So I take 1.9 to the 2 thirds power. 1.9 to the 2 thirds power is 1.5. So Mars is 1.5 AU from the sun. OK? Questions about this? This is all online, by the way. I mean, you're welcome to take a picture, but the PDF is on the website, too. Feel free to take pictures, but I'm just saying it's up there so you don't have to frantically do it. 
Any questions? But what if the question said in meters? How far is Mars from the sun in meters? Then what are you going to do? All right. Well, earlier in the lecture I told you that an astronomical unit was 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. So now I just have to convert, I have to turn 1.5 AU into meters. Just to walk you through this, we know, so one way to, one sort of very precise way to think about this, so this is unit conversion, okay? We know what something is in AU and we want to multiply by something that gives us the answer in meters. We know that there are 1.5 to 10 to the 11 meters in one astronomical unit. So that if we take 1.5 to 10 to the 11 meters and divide it by one astronomical unit, that's one. So that means I can take this number and multiply it by one and I get the same number, right? But I do it in such a way that the AUs cancel out. And now I'm left with units of meters. If I multiply all this stuff together, I get this, something like 2 times 10 to the 11 meters. We good? So let me just clarify this too. There's another way of writing this equation that's even simpler than this. And it's to use this sign right here. This sign is called proportional to. Who has seen this sign before? Who has not seen this sign before? Okay. This sign means proportional to. You can think of it like an equal sign. Except it's even easier than an equal sign because you can be very sloppy. All right. Um, I'm not, I, I'm, I don't care what the period of the Earth is or what the radius of the Earth or the distance between the Earth and the Sun is. I just know that the period of a planet squared is proportional to the distance between the planet and the Sun cubed. So it means I don't know what the, co there's some number that multiplies out here. I don't know what that number is. I just know that if I cube the planet's distance between, the cube the distance between the planet and the Sun, and its period will go up proportionally with the period squared every single time. So that means that effectively I could have rewritten this equation rather than period of the Earth, I could have used period of Mars and distance between Mars and, and Sun here. I could have picked any planet, right? There's nothing special about the Earth. So the proportionality sign means that I can rewrite this in many different ways. P planet squared over P Jupiter squared equals R planet cubed divided by R Jupiter cubed. I could pick anything as a starting point. Proportionality just says it just scales that way. Another thing you could say, for example, is the area of a circle is proportional to its radius squared. So if I double the area of a circle, if I double the radius of a circle, its area goes up by a factor of four. If I triple the radius of a circle, its area goes up by a factor of what? Two times two times, or three times three is nine. nine. Good, I got it. Uh, nine. So uh, you can rewrite it this way. Okay, so that's all the proportional sign means. So you will see me occasionally maybe break out into proportional signs later. If you get confused, just ask me. But you can think of it, so it sort of mathematically it carries through like an equal sign. You just can drop all the coefficients. So this is really nice because you don't have to remember the pi. So you say 2 pi or pi? I never can remember. Well, it doesn't matter. It always scales like r squared and then you just go. Okay. In a general sense, Kepler's laws apply to basically any bodies that orbit other massive bodies in the solar system. In the sense that the period squared will always go like the radius cubed. Okay. But you have to but it, for example, if it's moons of Jupiter, you have to then focus only on the moons of Jupiter. They have that proportionality with each other. But they tend to orbit in ellipses, and they tend to obey these kind of things where they move fast when they're near, the, near their paracenter, and they go slow when they're far away at so-called apocenter. So paracenter when it's close, apocenter when it's far away. Okay? Um, so 
if this, and this just show you some pictures, by the way, to get a sense of things. Here is a zoom in to all the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, around the sun. And you can see their orbits are very circular, especially the Earth. See how circular the Earth is? Mars is a little bit off. And then the outer planets, again, are still pretty circular. Pluto is on here, even though Pluto isn't a full-fledged planet, we call it a dwarf planet now. It's still a thing that goes around the sun and it obeys these laws. But you can see it's a little cockeyed in its orbit. It's got sort of a more extended orbit. Now, comets, for example, here's Halley's Comet. Comets have these really elongated elliptical orbits. And so like I was saying before, when they get close to the sun, they're going really fast and then they slow way up when they're far away from the sun. Um, the moon does this around the Earth. You just got through with this phases of the moon thing. And you remember there was a movie that you watched in the Rocket Mix module where you watched the moon go through phases? If you watch this a few times, you might notice the moon actually is kind of getting bigger a little, just a hair bigger and smaller, sort of doing this a little bit and kind of. Well, that's because it's not in a perfect circle around the Earth. It's in a little bit of an ellipse. And in fact, when it's closest to the Earth, it's a little bit bigger than it is when it's farther than the Earth. So this is full moon taken a couple years ago when the Earth, when the moon was as close as it gets to the Earth. And this is full moon when it was far away. And so you can see that, you know, it's not that much different, but it is, it is perceptible. You can actually see it. It does get a little bit closer, a little bit farther away. All right. Questions about that? Okay. So uh, I'm going to do a ratio problem. Okay. <coughs> I was thinking about a particular football game tonight that I'm excited to watch. I was building this problem. So let's say, let's say we take Jupiter. You orbit a Jupiter. And we squeeze the orbit of Jupiter down so that it can fit inside a football field like this. Okay. If we did that, how big would the sun be? The sun itself on that scale, right? So I take the solar system, I take the Jupiter, but I make its orbit, I squeeze it into a football field. How big is the sun? So I can tell you how big those numbers are in meters, right? The size of Jupiter's orbit in meters, the size of the sun in meters. But problems like this, ratio problems, really give you a visceral sense of how big and small things are, right? So let me remind you before we begin with this problem, the sun is really big, okay? The sun is so big, you could take the Earth, the whole planet Earth, right? So it's the biggest thing we could ever even hope to imagine how big it is really with a visceral sense. You could take 100 Earths and put them across the face of the sun. So the sun is big. I'm going to take the orbit of Jupiter. I'm going to shrink it down to the size of a football field and figure out how big the sun would be on that scale. So a more precise way of stating it is this. Uh, OK. Let's assume that Jupiter is 5.2 AU away from the sun. And an AU is 1.5 from 10 to the 11 meters. If you took that orbit and you shrunk it down so that the radius of its orbit was 25 meters, okay, that, would, that would allow it to fit. If you basically put it on the 50 yard line, it would touch either sideline. So it wouldn't go all the way to the end zone, but it would get close, sort of halfway there. Uh, and the radius of the, um, we know that the radius of the sun is 7 times 10 to the 5 kilometers or 7 times 10 to the 8 meters. And let's just compare that to the radius of Jupiter, the distance between Jupiter and the sun. It's 5.2 AU, and AU is 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. That's 7.8 times 10 to the 11 meters. So we've got something that's 7 times 10 to the 8 meters, the sun, compared to Jupiter which is almost 8 times 10 to the 11 meters. So what we want to do is we want to say, well, if I took Jupiter, the radius of Jupiter's orbit, and shrunk it down to 25 meters, on the same scale, how big would the sun be? See what I'm saying? Is there questions about the setup here? 
So the ratio of Jupiter to 25 meters is the same as the ratio of the sun to what? We're solving for that what? Is that what going to be bigger or smaller than 25 meters? Smaller. Who thinks smaller? Who thinks bigger? Okay, we've got a lot of people who are not sure. Okay, we'll walk through it. Wait, let's talk, let's talk about this. Okay, what's bigger, the, Earth, the sun or the radius of Jupiter, Jupiter's orbit? Jupiter's orbit's way bigger than the sun, right? The sun is 10 to the 8 meters. Jupiter is 10 to the 11 meters. It's a factor of 1,000, okay? So it's going to be small. How small? How small is the sun going to be? All right, let's walk through this. Um, so I want to solve this equation. I multiply both sides by x. Cross them out. And then I have x, rs over 25 meters equals the radius of the sun. I'm solving for x, remember. So now I'm going to multiply both sides by 25 meters. Get rid of the 25 meters. OK, they're gone. Now I solve for x. So x is equal to the radius of the sun times 25 meters divided by the distance between the Sun and Jupiter. Yeah? Did it change to 50 somewhere? Where did I write it? 50. Oh, that's a typo. I'm sorry. It's supposed to be 25. I think on the first, yeah. How did I? Uh, yeah, I'll fix this. In, I'm sorry. I'll fix this in the PDF. It's 25. OK, then I multiply this all through. When you do that, OK, you just plug in the numbers here. And you get something like 2, t two times 10 to the minus 2 meters. 2 times 10 to the minus 2 meters is about 2 centimeters. OK, so if the whole orbit of Jupiter were shrunk down to the size of a football field, the sun would be two centimeters big. It's a tiny little thing. That's the size of a coin. Okay. So that's the same size as the coin they're going to flip in about an hour and a half to decide who gets the kick, who, who gets the ball first, I guess. Okay. So I've got a couple more things, but we're out of time. So I'll finish up with stuff later, and we'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>